Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's NCRN webinar. We're going to uh, start with a short video from Backer Pass. Susie, you can mute people if they don't. I just did. Okay. <laughs> organizing and bringing new people uh, on. And welcome everyone tonight. My name is Susie Beiersdorfer and I'm the president of NCRN. And uh, also I'm from Ohio, so part of the Ohio Community Rights Network. And our network um, has representatives from Oregon, Nancy Ward, and Virginia, Heidi, uh, and Pennsylvania, Kara, and I think those are the people on uh, right now. So again, um, it's great that people can keep muted so that we can listen uh, to the speakers and Nancy will take it away. Hmm. Thank you, Susie. And thanks everybody for being here, particularly Will. We so appreciate you taking the time. We know this is a crunch time for you. We'll get into the details of that crunch here shortly. But by way of introduction, if you're not familiar with Will, Will uh, Falk is a writer, a lawyer, and an environmental activist. And he doesn't consider those three things as separate job descriptions. He finds a way to combine all of those into his daily life, which I find rather awe-inspiring and also uh, wondering how you possibly can wear all those hats at once. Um, Backing up just a little bit, I remember at the end of last year, you were on the Ohio River and you were tra traveling on the Ohio River, you were writing, you were communing with nature, so to speak. And then the next thing you know, I saw a post and you're in Thacker Pass and Thacker Pass in Nevada. So you went a long ways from Ohio to Thacker Pass. And I think my first question is why Thacker Pass? Well, um, I guess the, the story kind of begins with um, one of my best friends, Max Wilbert, who is also a writer. And um, he was working on a book called Bright Green Lies, uh, which is about, um, you know, problems within the so-called alternative energy industry and why so many so many of those um, solutions are not really solutions, um, why they involve, you know, more of the same and why they're so 
um, intertwined with the fossil fuel industry. But while he was researching that book, um, he, he came across this, this Thacker Pass uh, lithium mine project. And um, Northern Nevada is a place where both Max and I have spent a lot of time. Um, we really love the Great Basin. Um, and it's a place that we've driven uh, past many times. And so uh, Max uh, went out and, and saw the, the project site in October of, of last year. And then I saw him about three or four weeks later at a at a, like a Thanksgiving friends gathering. Mm. And he was saying that, he, he, you know, we should do something. What should we do? And I said, why don't we go out there and set up camp and, and see who we can get to come with us and see if we can't stop the damn thing. Um, so uh, yeah, to, so on January 15th, um, that's the same day that the Bureau of Land Management issued their final record of decision um, permitting the, the mine. Um, Max and I uh, took a little two-person tent and set up camp in, um, in what is called Thacker Pass. So Thacker Pass is uh, on the traditional territories of the Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone peoples. Um, the, the local Fort McDermott Paiute uh, have named Thacker Pass Pahi Maha, um, which is a name that uh, actually comes from a massacre. Um, there's a story where um, many of the Paiute uh, hunters were away in, a, in another valley um, and they came back to find uh, their, their village and their loved ones uh, slaughtered with their intestines pulled out and strung along the sagebrush uh, in, in the pass. Mm -hmm. And um, it was uh, understandably a very rotten scene. So Pahi is, the, is a word for rotten and Maha is the word for moon. Um, and, and Thacker Pass itself, Pahi Maha is shaped like a crescent moon. Um, so so they, gave, they gave it the name Pahi Maha. Um, there are um, many, many creatures that live in Pahimaha. This is some of the last um, and best remaining old growth sagebrush habitat uh, left on earth. Um, I know maybe a lot of people don't know very much about sagebrush, but sagebrush is a really remarkable um, being uh, who uh, when, when sagebrush gets uh, to their mature age, um, they can be as old as 125, 150 years old when they're four or five feet tall. And there are four and five feet tall uh, sagebrush um, in Pahimaha, in Protect, or in Thacker Pass. Um, it, this is also uh, some of the best remaining uh, greater sage grouse uh, habitat left on earth. Greater sage grouse are a species that um, have been decimated since the arrival of Europeans in the area. Um, they estimate that uh, populations are down uh, between 97 and 99 percent of what they were um, pre-1800. Um, and sage grouse are an incredible animal. Um, you know, if you if you just Google search them, you'll see the male um, sage grouse sage grouse. Um, um, strutting and doing their their mating dance and that's something that um, we got to see in April uh, just a, one of the, the most beautiful experiences of my life. Um, there are also golden eagle nests that surround Pihimaha. Golden eagles are especially sacred um, to native peoples in this area. They believe that golden eagles are directly um, connected to the creator and um, that they're, they're a, an animal that um, deserves our utmost respect. Um, since setting up camp in January, we've seen coyotes, we've seen red foxes, we've seen badgers, we've seen mule deer, um, antelope, um, little antelope yearling, yearlings came dancing through camp a lot in the spring. Um, uh, so there's there's a lot of life that that lives in Thacker Pass, and so um, when you know why why go defend Thacker Pass, um, my answer is because of all all those other beings. That that for me is is my first answer. I think that um, one of the one of the big reasons why the dominant culture has um, produced the destruction that it has. Um, is because we've we've forgotten that um, our other than human kin really are our kin, 
and we've we've set up this worldview where where the rest of the planet exists only for human use and when you think things like this um then then you can justify um blowing up a huge uh, open pit lithium mine um for electric cars um with the assumption that human beings need cars um and you know i i wanted to come to thacker pass to to really make the point that um, you know, only some some privileged members of the human species will be able to afford these electric cars. They're not they're not actually something that that we need to survive. At least not in the same way that sage grouse need water. Um, not in the same way that uh, sage sage grouse need that old growth sagebrush um, for their homes. Um, not in the same way that. Um, uh, those little antelope yearlings who are what are called sagebrush um, dependent species, they only eat sagebrush. Um, so when you take out huge swaths of sagebrush, you're, you're, you're making it really hard for other beings like antelope to survive. Um, and, you know, just kind of watching the, um, I think the environmental movement, a, a, a big part of the environmental movement has kind of gotten seduced by this green energy stuff. Um, and if you if you don't respect the natural world, if you don't um, you don't see that the needs of the land are primary, the needs of the land are more important than the needs of of some members of one species on that land. Um, then it's easy for you to excuse all kinds of destruction. Um, and so I, I really saw Thacker Pass as uh, this you know this this symbol of of what could be coming um, if if people if people are going to insist that we can sacrifice what's left of the natural world for um, you know whatever our new favorite technologies are. <clears throat> so you're talking about um, an area of the world that I think a lot of us are not familiar with. So how big a, an area is the mining project going to be encompassing? The total project area is uh, just under 18,000 acres um, and that that the total direct disturbance footprint um, is just under 6,000 acres. Um, so what they want to do is um, create a huge open pit mine there. Uh, the lithium that they want to extract is in um, soil that is very clay um, based. And um, the way that they're going to extract that lithium is by uh, using sulfuric acid to leach the, the lithium out of the clay. So what they have to do is they have to scrape out all the earth and then they run it through um, this chemical process. And that sulfuric acid um, is supposed to leach that lithium out. Um, of course, then you have um, really toxic soil left over, and this is a really water intensive process. Um, they're using, they're going to, they estimate that they'll use 5,200 um, acre feet of water every single year. Um, that's billions of gallons of water every year in the driest region on earth, or not on earth, the driest region in the United States. Um, and uh, at a time when the United States has declared the first ever official water shortage. <clears throat> So how can a project like this take hold? I mean, it's going to have to have lots of agencies look at it. It's going to have to receive permits. Can you tell us what that process looks like and, and how does it look as far as any possibility of the permits being denied? Yeah, this, that's, that's a really good question, especially in the community rights context. Um, because the project is uh, entirely on public land, on land owned by the federal government. Um, mm. I, uh, I didn't realize this, but um, I believe that um, something like 60% of the actual land um, area of the United States is owned by the federal government as public land. Um, in, in the state of Nevada, it's something like 85% of Nevada is, is public federal land. Um, so what that means is the the federal government controls um, what happens there, and um, so so in like the community rights uh, context, Thacker Pass, um, the the closest actual municipality um, to Thacker Pass is Winnemucca, Nevada, and um, that's sixty miles away. Um, so 
you know, these, these little towns that kind of exist, these little ranching communities and little farming communities, um, they don't really have any sort of local government um, angle to, to push back against these projects um, because, because the federal government controls it. Um, and what, another thing that's really interesting, um, a lot of people when they hear public lands, um, and this is kind of a misnomer, they, they think, oh, those are the lands that we can go camp on, and those are the ones that the government holds for our enjoyment and everything. Well, that's actually not true. In 1872, the federal government passed uh, what was called the 1872 Mining Act. The federal government was deeply in debt from the Civil War, and um, they needed a way to um, make money quickly. So they passed this 1872 Mining Act, which sold really cheap mining leases and designated um, certain mineral mining on these lands as uh, the highest and best use of public lands. Um, so uh, if, if miners want, if, if a mining corporation wants to come in and, and stake a claim on, on public land, um, there's not very much that BLM can really do to stop them. The, the 1872 mining law supersedes other uses of the land. Um, and, you know, so, so local communities really don't have much of a legal angle to stop these kinds of projects. Um, and it also, you know, there's a lot of talk about changing the 1872 mining law, which, yes, of course, the 1872 mining law should be changed, but um, there's so many mining corporations that make so much money, and the government makes so much money from this law um, that it's, it's probably not something that's going to be changed like, through Congress or, or, or something like that. Um, um, I forgot well, there the other I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I forgot the other parts of your question. <laughs> oh, I was talking about the permitting process and, and you're explaining that it looks pretty bleak. I'm, I'm wondering like what possibly would be a reason that the, a permit could be de denied? Well, um, yeah, they have, um, the one of the big things that's going on uh, in the legal fight against um, the Thacker Pass mine is um, a, a, set, a, a local rancher and four environmental um, organizations, regional environmental organizations, um, have sued uh, the Bureau of Land Management over their issuing the permit using the National Environmental Policy Act, um, which is, this is totally classic regulatory law. Um, and what they're saying is um, that the, the uh, BLM fast-tracked this project. So they, they, they gave the scoping notice and their intent to draft an environmental impact statement in January, 2020. And less than a year later, they had already issued the final permit. Um, so these wow. environmental organizations are saying they didn't do an adequate environmental review. Um, they have comments from other agencies that said this went way too fast. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the only um, really likely conclusion to this is that the judge kicks this project back into an earlier um, um, phase of the permitting process, basically tells BLM to go back to the drawing board and spend more time analyzing this. Um, and, you know, likely Lithium Nevada, the corporation involved here and uh, BLM will shore up their, um, the, the environmental impact statement and um, in a couple years be able to say that um, they have adequately considered everything. Um, so, you know, the only real way that the mine could be stopped through that angle is if it just ended up costing Lithium Nevada too much money to um, litigate this or their investors were getting scared off and they um, they didn't have enough capital to to build the mine. <clears throat> well, you, of course, have been involved in the community rights work for a long time on, on both sides of the aisle, both as a, a lawyer and as an activist. So I'm sure you're bringing that component to the effort that you're putting forth at Thacker Pass. And I'd love to have you talk a little bit about how you're melding community rights into a process that probably most of the people in that area are not familiar with. 
Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of the community rights efforts that I've been involved in, um, you know, have been about uh, drafting uh, local um, community rights and rights of nature um, ordinances and laws. Um, and um, in an effort to um, challenge things like, you know, state and federal preemption, uh, corporate rights, um, and often those campaigns are engaged in not because we think those ordinances are ultimately going to stand up in court, but as a way to really show people um, how the government will come in and smash any attempt at at, at community rights, um, any attempt at at um, you know truly protecting the natural world. Um, in in this case, uh, with the with the whole project being on federal land, there's no angle that we can take in that way. Um, there's no you know uh, municipality that we could um, you know get to draft a, a, a rights of nature ordinance, for example, to um, stop stop the mine or or claim that the mine has a right to exist and and corporations shouldn't have a right to destroy it um, because it's all on federal land and there's just no jurisdiction here. Um, but I think um, one of the things that Max and I ha have have wanted to be really clear about from the very beginning um, is that um, we don't think it's 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 not enough to tell people that um, the the lawsuits and um, something like the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, you can tell people that those laws don't actually have the power to stop these projects. They only have the power to make sure that um, the corporation jumps through all the hoops. Um, but a lot of people don't really believe us, um, even though we we say it. Um, so we've kind of um, and, and shown how this is true, you know, in so many cases. Um, so we've we've we said, well, screw it. We're gonna um, we'll we'll go through the process with everyone, um, and you know, show everybody, you know, what's what's really gonna happen. Tell them what we expect to happen. And um, maybe that will, you know, kind of radicalize some people and and help them see how uh, environmental law actually works in the United States. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I'm I'm working on right now. And in, in what you were talking about, Nancy, is um, I've been I, I represent the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Uh, and a true uh, and a group of traditional uh, members of the Fort McDermott uh, Paiute and Shoshone tribe, um, and we have, um, in an effort to stop some archaeological digs that were planned for this summer, um, we we have tried to gain a uh, we're trying to get a, a preliminary injunction to stop those archaeological digs. Um, by claiming that uh, BLM failed to undergo the, the, the adequate consultation process with the tribes. Um, Pihimaha is sacred, there's the massacre sites, um, there's ceremonies and other things that happen there. Um, it's been used for millennia for, um, for prayer and ceremony, as well as traditional gathering practices. And, um, but, you know, it's been interesting to kind of educate my clients about um, it, the, the National Historic Preservation Act, which is the big law that we're using, um, it doesn't actually give the, tr give the tribes the power of consent um, to say no to these projects. It only says the BLM has to consult with them before they, before they do the projects. Um, and, and I think in a tribal perspective, it's even more clear to people why this is so bad, you know. Um, we've found through this case records of a massacre that happened in Thacker Pass in 1865, um, where where a land um, a federal land agent was out surveying the land and and three years later was still finding bones and other remains from the massacre. Um, so you know, look at what we're talking about. This happened in 1865. Uh, in 2021, the the direct lineal descendants of those people um, are saying, don't destroy our sacred sites. You already massacred us. You already forced us at the point of a gun onto reservations. And, and we're saying, don't take our artifacts, don't take our sacred sites. Um, and, and in some ways, we're even saying, at least talk to us before you do it. Um, and the federal government is saying no. Um, and, you know, it, 
if if the if the court cases fail and and uh, people decide to engage in direct action, you know, um, it's going to look a lot like 1865 here. You're going to have native people standing in Thacker Pass um, in front of, um, you know, quite frankly, a lot of white guys with guns um, who are saying, get out of our way, we're coming to take your resources. Um, so um, I try to, we, you know, I try and help people see that historical context, even my clients while, you know, while I'm representing them um, and uh, just just helping everybody remember how colonial the, the legal system really is. So, Will, I'm a little uh, fuzzy on the, on the combination of an archeological dig and the project itself. Are they doing the dig because of the project? So they're trying to take the um, history out so it's not destroyed during the, the creation of the project? Is that what's happening? Yeah, so that's, yeah, thanks for asking that because um, I think that's that's one thing that I've really learned through this process and I probably should have realized this earlier, but just about every square inch of this continent is covered in, in the history of, of the people who have lived here for time immemorial. Um, and in the West, that's especially true where there's, there's less development and larger open places. Um, so just in, in the project area here, um, the Bureau of Land Management has um, identified over 1,000 what they call cultural resource sites. And these cultural resource sites are things like old campgrounds that Native people used, um, places. There's, there's uh, one of my kind of favorite um, aspects of Pahimaha is there's this huge, what they call an obsidian procurement district um, that, that runs along the south edge of the project area. So this is um, an old volcanic hotspot that left a, a, a lot of obsidian. And apparently people from as far as Mexico were coming up into Thacker Pass to um, harvest the obsidian um, to use for things like arrowheads and, and other um, tools. They're, they use the obsidian in, in certain traditional medicines. Um, but um, yeah, there's this whole archeological industry that only exists because the federal government is, is issuing permits for these projects. And um, according to the federal government, um, the best way to mitigate damage to these uh, to these artifacts and sacred sites and campsites and um, ceremonial sites um, is to go uh, take those artifacts off the land, put them in plastic bags, put them in boxes, put them in an archaeological warehouse where they sit for two or three years while archaeologists create their theories about what they were used. And then by federal law, they're sent to a federally approved repository and they're, they don't go back to the, to the tribes anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't think I I don't think I understand how can how can those digs not result in it being returned to the tribes? What's because, the mechanism that doesn't allow that to happen? Because it's not um, because it's on federal land. It's no it's not the tribes' land, so it's not tribal land according to the American government. It's the, the American government's land, um, and so um, those. I mean this, yeah. Um, and that's that's kind of one of the big things that's going to be happening in in my arguments on Friday is is the Bureau of Land Management and Lithium Nevada are going to be saying what's the big deal we're we're going to go get the arrowheads we're not going to destroy them we're going to take them off the land um, and my clients are saying well in in our culture it's it's totally blasphemous to remove those artifacts we think really bad things happen to people who who move stuff like that and um, we also think that it's problematic when you take it when you take an arrowhead off the land it, you no longer know the context from which that arrowhead was produced um, and um, you know it's really just government sanctioned looting um, and again there's this whole archaeological industry that exists just to remove these artifacts from these projects um, and you know they, they are profiting off of of colonialism in a very direct way so your clients, I assume, are the indigenous of the area. Is that correct? 
Yeah, the the closest um, reservation to the to the project area is the Fort McDermott um, Paiute and Shoshone tribe, um, and um, they it's a it's probably about um, I don't know forty miles or so from the project area, um, but this is a community that's already been um, hurt by mines. There's uh, a couple mercury mines uh, even closer to the reservation that um, were ultimately shut down in the '80s. Um, but uh, this this group of of traditional folks that we've become really good friends with, um, there's uh, some of the grandmas in that group are in their 70s and 80s, and and one of the ladies, her husband died from cancer from that mercury mine, um, and so they know what these mines do, and um, you know the 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 wind from the project site blows right at the reservation. So all of the dust, all of any sort of air pollution that's going to happen at the mine is going to go right at the reservation. Um, and it's going to make a lot of people sick. And um, meanwhile, it's using up all the water. And, you know, a lot of tribal members have told me that they fully expect the um, eventually the mines to, to come for the water on the reservations. And, um, you know, we've seen this play out so many times. <clears throat> So how uh, the, the tribes have counseled themselves. Are you in, in uh, conversation with them about their legal, are they taking legal actions separate from yours? Yeah, so um, that's, that's one of the really, another really interesting thing about this. Um, I think a lot of times, um, well, the government has been so successful in propping up tribal councils as the legitimate authority for tribal issues. Um, and this, this is an old colonial tactic that started from the very beginning where um, to get, you know, to get treaties signed and other agreements, um, you know, settlers would identify a few people in a, in a native community that were sympathetic to them and then claim that they were like the chief or the leader, um, when in reality, that's not really how native communities even worked. Um, so uh, on, on the reservations, a lot of times, um, just like we know that our state and federal government don't always represent our best interests, um, tribal councils don't always represent um, members of the tribe's best interests. Um, so at Fort McDermott, um, the, the tribal council really hasn't um, made a, a statement one way or the other, whether they're um, against the mine. Um, and it, so that's kind of left us with with the traditional folks um, uh, who who basically got uh, tired of waiting for the tribal council to do anything um, and said let's let's move on our own. Uh, luckily, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, um, which is farther away from the project area, um, um, is is. Um, uh, one of the more politically powerful tribes in Nevada. Um, they have a, a chairman of their tribal council who's been there. He's been the chairman for 30 years. Um, he's a he's a really amazing um, person. Um, but their tribal council recognized the danger um, that this mine posed even to their community and the danger that lithium mining was going to pose to all the tribes in Nevada. Um, and they have a really strong cultural resources department, which um, mm. um, which has been amazingly helpful in, in, uh, in us understanding the history and, and um, the culture that is in Thacker Pass. Um, and so they, they voted um, to actually sue BLM and join in the lawsuit with, with their relatives in the Fort McDermott tribe. And then um, just a couple of weeks ago, another tribe in Oregon, the Burns Paiute tribe, um, wow. uh, joined in. And um, I mean, that, that's, that's another thing is the way that um, the way that things worked back then, the the um, the, the American cavalry transported people um, from northern Nevada all the way up to Washington State, over into California. Um, so you have Paiute and Shoshone people um, who, um, you know, they got moved from their traditional lands, but then um, they're all they they're related to many people from the different reservations and. Um, the Bureau of Land Management is trying to claim that because the Fort McDermott tribe isn't vocally 
um, oppositional to the mine, then that must mean that um, all native people everywhere approve of the mine. Um, and it's, it's um, you know, we have to convince the judge that that's not true. So you're going to court this coming Friday. Yes. What is the legal um, terminology for what is happening and and what do you expect uh, the what would the positive outcome look like of your effort? Um, yeah, so we're having uh, what are called oral arguments on uh, our motion for a preliminary injunction. Um, so a preliminary injunction is a court order um, that prevents someone from doing something. Uh, American law uh, treats any, most all injuries or harm that you suffer, American law assumes that money can always cure that injury. Um, um, and so usually the, the, the presumption or the assumption in American law is um, uh, projects can be ongoing while litigation is happening because if the judge finds that the corporation broke the law later, uh, the corporation can just pay the plaintiff's money and everything's good. Well, thankfully, American law has um, at least recognized that in, in environmental contexts or um, in cultural contexts like, like um, the one we're working on, sometimes money isn't an adequate um, repayment. Um, so what we're doing is, is we're trying to get um, the archaeological dig stopped until the lawsuit has been fully litigated and the judge has made a decision. Um, practically, what that would mean is that um, Pahimaha would probably not be disturbed um, until uh, after the snows thaw in the spring at the earliest. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> It, the the best case scenario is that um, the judge agrees with us that um, uh, BLM um, did not uh, engage in a reasonable effort to consult with the tribes about the cultural and religious significance of Pahimaha, um, and that uh, the, my clients would be irreparably harmed by these archaeological digs, which include things like mechanical trenching. You know, they they. They have to go dig up the artifacts to know that they're truly there. <laughs> um, and, um, but yeah, the best case scenario is that the judge um, says, you know, you, you can't do that until this consultation um, happens and that she will, will pause their plans to do that. So that'll buy you some time. Uh, how do you plan to spend that time? Um, we've, we've got to organize, um, you know, massive, uh, support, um, uh, Thacker Pass is a remote, you know, the, like the closest tiny little town, which is basically just a gas station is 20 miles, um, from the project site. Uh, it's, it's honestly, and Max will probably shoot me for saying this, but it's not, um, it's not the most comfortable place to be. Um, in, in the winter, it's really cold and it snows a lot. Um, and um, the wind never stops blowing. And uh, in the summer, um, it's hot and the wind never stops blowing and the dust and there's no trees. Um, and um, so the reason I'm saying this is, you know, I think it's a little different than some other direct action uh, scenarios where, um, you know, like, um, you know, in line three, there's a lot of population centers, um, at least relatively close. Um, so you have that sort of city activism that's going on, um, where there's a ready, a ready um, kind of population of people who are willing to come out and stand with you. Um, that's, that's not necessarily the case in Nevada. Um, and then um, I guess the even bigger thing is, you know, a lot of environmentalists really criticize us for this. They're saying, how can you stand in the way of electric cars? Um, and, um, you know, so it's, it's not like we have the, the, the typical uh, environmental movement behind okay. us and access to all those bodies. Um, so we're going to have to work really hard to um, 
let people know what's going on and um, just try and rally as much support as we can in the time that, that we're given. So when uh, the local uh, people from Fort McDermott come out, do they come with the idea that they are going to continue their rituals, continue their heritage by treating the land the way they have always treated it? Or do they come with a, a plan to defend it um, at any cost? Is there, what is the talk when, when all of you get together at Thacker Pass and you're staying there for several days together? Yeah, um, I mean, one of, one of the best stories I have is um, uh, the, the Fort McDermott folks kind of learned about the project uh, right at the end of February and early March. And um, there's this, this, uh, this, the, these five sisters um, that range from age, I think, 86 to like 68. And um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in their um, living room trying to understand uh, why, why Pihimaha is so sacred to them. Um, and one of those times, you know, the five of them sat across from me and looked me in the eye and said that, they'll die before they let Thacker Pass um, be destroyed. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we know what the perfect strategy is right now. Um, you know, just like with any grassroots organizing, um, so many of us have, have never done anything like this before. Um, and uh, one of the most important things about this campaign that I've really learned is, is the importance of of the human relationships um, between those of us involved in the campaign, really getting to know each other, really getting to, to love each other, um, and really um, getting to a point where we can trust each other in, in stressful situations. Um, you know, um, I guess a good example of this is uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Bureau of Land Management came up and um, brought a trespass notice that was uh, only addressed to Max and I. And it threatened us with um, over $75,000 in fines. Um, I think triple the, um, the annual rental rate, market rental rate of the land um, and jail time and more fines if we didn't remove uh, these outhouses that we had put up and some wind structures that wind blocks that are put up there. Um, and, you know, I can't spend a lot of time at camp right now while I'm doing this stuff, but you really have to trust the other people at camp um, to be able to, you know, take stuff down or, um, you know, kind of help you navigate the, the cops when, when that stuff happens. So that's interesting be that they decided that that you and Max were the ones to target. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we have questions from our, the people who are here. Does it, yes, Maria? Maria? You're muted, Maria. Uh, I have recently read about that there is the possibility of growing hemp to produce hemp alcohol that could be used in electric, in, in cars instead of gasoline. And that, that would make uh, lithium totally unnecessary. Have you heard of that or is there any kind of argument going on about that? Yeah, so... Um... <laughs> What, so the, the, the way I understand that, um, what they're saying about hemp and, and hemp batteries, what hemp is, is able to do is actually replace um, only a, a part of the lithium ion battery. Um, it's, it's not able to, um, uh, it's not efficient enough or it's not able to store enough energy to, to replace all of the lithium battery. So it's only a fraction of the battery. Um, but I don't, in some ways, I don't even like to engage in that part of it because, um, you know, uh, hemp 
hemp agriculture, you know, I'm against blowing a, a hole in a mountain. I'm against deforesting to grow hemp. I'm, I'm against uh, clearing gra grasslands to grow one industrial crop on land that um, thousands of other beings really need. Um, so I don't see at hemp as a solution for, for really anything, especially at the industrial scale that, um, you know, it would have to be grown to, to um, be a replacement for the things that they would say it was a replacement. But I'm also, um, I'm also really against car culture. Um, and we have to remember that every aspect of, a, of the manufacture of a car um, involves destroying places like Thacker Pass. Um, that goes from, from you know, the iron ore that's in the steel in our cars, the, the glass that's in our cars, of course, the plastic that's in our cars, we all know about that. Um, and, um, you know, one of the kind of uh, controversial things I say, or that people think are, is controversial is, um, you know, human beings have been Homo sapiens sapiens for 250,000 years, and it's only been for the last 249,050 years, well, the last 50 of those, those years um, that some human beings have had automobiles. Um, so this notion that human beings need cars is refuted by 249,050 years of human history. Um, and um, <sighs> It also, I think, ignores the, the effects, all of the effects on the natural world that cars have, not just the, the carbon emissions, but um, the land clearances for roads, um, the amount of wildlife that are killed by cars, um, the way that cities are, are designed because we have cars. Um, and, you know, at a time when human health is getting worse and worse because we're, we're so stationary, um, I just, I think that that car culture uh, has to go and the sooner the better. <clears throat> Any other questions? Comments, observations? I, I have a question or maybe a comment, I guess. Sure. So, um, I think there's a lot of people that can appreciate your passion for saving factor pass and might even get on board with that. But you sort of alienate, as you said, even a lot of environmentalists when you say, you know, just get rid of the car and don't have, you know, other avenues because I don't think that people are gonna get rid of their cars. I think that it's, people like their cars and, I think that you might find more support if you, and not you necessarily, but if you could connect with somebody who had alternative solutions, like the woman who asked about hemp, which I don't know anything about, but, you know, propose alternatives to say, rather than just say no cars, because I think that's a hard sell. I think it's going to be really hard to get people behind that, whereas if you said we need to save Thacker Pass and there are other solutions out there such as whatever it is, you could get a lot more people behind you. But just to say, no, don't do it, I, I, think, it's, I think it's a hard road for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, thing, the thing is, is, um, if I if I love Thacker Pass, which I do love Thacker Pass, then then I have to I have to love all the other places like Thacker Pass and um, love all the lands that are connected to Thacker Pass, love the the planet and the climate that make life possible in Thacker Pass, and car culture is a major part of why the planet is being destroyed. Um, so I understand that a lot of human beings don't like to hear that they they are gonna to have to give up their cars. And, and this is another thing, car culture will collapse because the, the resources that cars um, depend on, not just the, the gas, but all the manufacturing materials that go into cars are finite. And we're gonna run out of those. And when we have a whole culture, a whole way of living based off of, of the need for cars and those cars fail, um, there's gonna be a lot of human beings that are, are really suffering because of that. Um, so 
the longer this goes on, the worse things are going to get for those people. And we can pass the buck on to, on to other generations of, of humans um, and non-humans. Um, but to me, the truth is, is um, if, if my allegiance is first and foremost to the natural world, um, which it is, um, then I have to tell the truth. And that is that, that, that cars are, are destroying the planet, are part of what is destroying the planet. And um, unfortunately, um, they, they're, they're going to have to go. And, and, and if, if people can't come to that realization, then we truly are screwed anyway. So um, it, it's, it's better to speak the truth um, than not to is, is the way I see it. <clears throat> yeah, tough love, so to speak. And, and hard, hard to, for people to accept, but the truth is the truth. And uh, Maria, we'll get to you in just a minute because I think Heidi, didn't you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I just wanted to appreciate everything you said, Will. Um, just so profound. Um, my gosh, you, you pulled so much together. So, you know, so many factors together. Um, I, I just think um, this is brilliant um, on, and on so many levels um, where you're coming from and, and how you're approaching this and the integration of, of um, the, the community rights and the understanding of how um, the government works, the history of it, the, and the ind indigenous peoples. And so I just really wanna applaud you and thank you and wish, wish I could be out there with you, but we're like back home, uh, you know, um, in, our, in our comfort zones, um, trying to fight our battles. But gosh, I would just, my heart's with you, but <laughs> you. Um, I'd have to get there by car or plane. <laughs> and Maria. You're muted, Maria. Uh, whether you feel the same about public transportation. Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, I, 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 I think that um, the, the manufacture of, of public transportation depends on this whole industrial process that, um, it is really destroying the planet. Um, you know, you can't have buses without um, mining, without um, um, you know, refining metals, without uh, rubber, um, and uh, you know, yeah. Ultimately, I think we're have to, we're going to have to get back to to using our own feet to get around. Um, and uh, I know that there's there's a lot of things that have to happen before we get to that point. Um, but I, I think that's where we, we have to go. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I, I was just gonna say that, um, yeah, this is such a, a plea for local communities and to create local spaces where we're not shipping you know, things in from halfway around the world, but really creating uh, beloved communities. Um, at some point, you know, that's going to have to happen. You know, the, the, our comfort zones are uh, going to quickly degrade. And again, thank you, Will, for, for loving nature and loving all life. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Doug. Oh yeah, um, sorry. Thanks very much, Will, for uh, making this presentation. And I know you're really busy in what you're doing. I'm very optimistic about um, your, what you're doing and there's virtue in what you're thinking and how you approach it and you, you speak well. And um, there's a lot of other opportunity, opportunities to do other things to, to change the situation with lithium. Um, and I think I'm really, I'm very idealistic myself. And I really believe that, that we have to redesign and reorganize the way we live on this planet. And it's gonna take an, a, an awakening and it doesn't have to be a, dis a disaster or a catastrophe. 
it's just it, when there's virtue involved in things and the pure in that goodness it, it will open up and um all the power to all your efforts thank you and i am just posting in the chat a um a link to for those who have the ability to support Will and the work that's going on at Thacker Pass financially. I'm um, sure Nancy, that, that, yeah. Can you hear me? I'm Keala. I don't have my picture up there because my camera's got something over it. Yeah. To protect everybody because otherwise I would have had to comb my hair to get in on this conversation. <laughs> aloha, Will, and aloha, everybody. And this was a really, really great opportunity to hear um, you know, what's going on over there, get the skinny on it. Will, you know, I think you're a model for a kind of shift in human behavior. And I really hope your political consciousness is able to reach more pe people. But my question is this, um, what is the psychological challenge to telling the truth to a society that really doesn't want to hear this, that refuses to hear it? I mean, what's it like for you personally? You've done a really great job of telling us about the issues and super complicated stuff and you've pulled it together, together beautifully, but can you share something about the personal reality of what you're doing? I know you're going into court on Friday. I know you're probably exhausted, but can you just talk a little bit about that, this sort of activism in general? Uh, yeah, al aloha, Keala. Um, um, Keala, y'all, is, is, uh, is a great friend, a great um, um, Native Hawaiian journalist and filmmaker. Um, who I got to know while I was on on Mount Akea, um, and she has an amazing uh, documentary called Noho Heva um, that really talks especially about some of these uh, colonial things about culture um, and how there's a whole industry in the United States that profits off stealing um, native culture. Um, and her her film in Hawaii is brilliant, and I recommend everybody watch it. Um, so personally, um, oh, uh, <clears throat> I'm tired, you know. Um, I think um, I think one of the things that's hard for me to to sit with is uh, it, it's been about seven months now since Max and I uh, set up camp, and um, it's taken. It's, it's basically taken us giving up our lives to do this. And, um, you know, there's 8,000 other lithium claims in the state of Nevada alone. There's already um, a, an Australian company that is moving pretty quickly on another lithium mine about 20 miles north of Thacker Pass. Um, there's a man, uh, uh, a man from um, the, Hual the Hualapai tribe in Arizona um, who uh, there's a lithium mine that's going in right next to his reservation and he's coming up here, um, you know, to kind of brainstorm how we can stop down there. Um, and I think the truth is these kinds of um, purely defensive um, campaigns that we're engaging in and these campaigns that are purely based on, you know, trying to persuade people to do the right thing. Um, I mean, they're, we're just getting our ass kicked and more of the, the natural world is getting destroyed while we're, while our asses are getting kicked. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know really what else to do. That's why I'm doing this. Um, but I think we are going to have to learn how to um, be more effective much more quickly um, or else there's just not going to be any life left on earth. Um, and one thing that I kind of tell myself is, um, you know, unfortunately, it looks like uh, my generation and, you know, a couple generations above me, maybe one or two below, we're at this point in, in history where if we don't, if we don't figure this out, then no one's coming after us. And as tired and as um, drained as I get, um, 
I can't help but think of that. Um, and I try to use that to motivate myself when I feel like that. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, really serious things and, and we have to get effective quickly. <clears throat> yeah, I think we're all right there with you, Will. I mean, just as soon as you're ready to say there's just no way we can win is exactly when you have to reach down and pull up every reserve you've got and keep plugging ahead because it is so serious. And, and I am amazed continually at the number of people who cannot see it. And I, and I used to think that they wouldn't see it. And I've come to understand that they really can't, you know, because their life is comfortable and the area of the world that they live in is still beautiful. Um, and the, the mayhem that is going on is still in other places, but it's creeping closer and closer to all of us in so many ways. And hopefully, hopefully we can come up with a way. Uh, your description at the beginning of the sage grouse in Thacker Pass is, was so poetic. And those are the kind of things that keep all of us going. And if we're not here to help each other get through our, ho our low times as, and keep moving forward, I mean, that's why we're doing these things constantly, keeping in touch, because this is not necessarily popular work that we're doing, as you're finding out in the fact that, you're, that you have other environmentalists that are not supporting you. And that's heartbreaking, but here we are. And you're going to court on Friday and we will all be with you wondering um, if you can, uh, can you send us someplace to find out if we can be a uh, witness to this, if we can get on video, if we can call in via phone? Um, yeah, I'm sure. Um... Yeah, I can. I could send you, Nancy, that stuff, and you could send it out. Pass it along. Be I'm happy sure. to. I kind of. I don't have much involvement with um, the Protect Thacker Pass uh, social media or online stuff right now. Um, sure. But I would imagine that somebody can get that that stuff up there. I'll 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 um, I'll try and make sure that happens. Now, when you go into the courtroom on Friday, will you be going? Or are, are you going in virtually? Yeah, there's no no one's going to the to the courtroom. It's all on Zoom. Um, I'm pretty disappointed about it because the judge isn't going to see all the people that um, her decision is going to affect. But um, that's what she wants to do. So there's what I always say. There's nothing like God on earth like a judge in the courtroom, and mm -hmm. she's made her decision. <laughs> And will other be people be involved in the presentation or will this fall strictly on your shoulders? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm being, uh, uh, I have a lot of help from Terry Lodge, who I know some of you know. Um, he has been an amazing support and in, uh, his experience, um, he has vastly more experience than me. Um, so he, he'll, he'll be uh, appearing with me um uh and then there's um four other lawyers for the different plaintiff groups that are on our side um they're not make they won't be necessarily arguing on friday but um you know they'll they'll be there and if there's any sort of big decisions that need to be made they can um help us out <laughs> right right how, how long are you allowed uh, is this uh, a brief period or you, do you have the clock ticking while you're up there? Uh, the judge hasn't said. Um, okay. I'm going to dig in for probably two or three hours of arguments. Um, we'll see. It could, it could get wild on Friday because there's a lot going on. <clears throat> well, I'm sure those of us that can be there will be there and look forward to getting that information from you. Uh, really appreciate the fact that you took time away to come and visit with us because 
you're kind of like the boots on the ground right now. You are you are upfront and personal in a way that most of us have not been, and it, it's very valuable for me personally to hear this, and hoping that maybe some of us can actually show up at Thacker Pass, if for no other reason than to satisfy our own curiosity of this place and to have a chance to uh, experience it for ourselves as well as to lend support. So anybody that can go get in touch with Will, I'm sure we could bring him goodies and uh, contribute to the well-being of the camp, at least on a brief basis. And I don't know what you're well, doing, see, Heidi. I see Kara has her hand up. So um, oh, okay. we have time for, I, it says two participants, but I, I did see Kara. Uh, so great. Sorry, I didn't oh. see you, Kara. Thanks. Okay. So I listening to the conversation and will everything you're going through with your boots on the ground there it's you know I think that it's one end of the spectrum and I think what we have to look at in the middle I think to what Maria and Brady were saying it's a, you know this there's kind of a hard thing to come to from one end to the end where there's no cars. I know one thing that, I, mean, I feel like we're all hypocritical. You know, we're all driving cars. We are all using um, plastic. That, you know, there, there's plastic within arm's reach of everybody in on this call here. Um, one thing, and you know, I got very depressed one day when we were trying to eradicate plastic and realized how invasive that is in our lives and you know then it's like how do you avoid the hypocrisy and you know with without living in the sand and which which is kind of what you're doing <laughs> right now <laughs> but, but um we we try to do an 80 20 rule where you know it's like there are some things that you can't avoid but it's become like a puzzle to figure out the plastic existed for 50 years. All of these things, like you said, cars existed for 50 years. I think cars are gonna be a lot harder to go by. There's a lot of medical reasons why people can't walk and won't walk and mental, mentally, you know, that's, that's going to take time. But within to ease our own minds, just to be able to follow that 80-20 rule and try to say, uh, I, instead of a planter, plastic planters, I use cookie sheets. You know, I, it's become fun trying to find the alternative, trying to figure out what they did before the plastic. Right. But it makes me feel a lot better and less hypocritical to to work on it from that aspect than than the you know it's it's really hard to swallow the end of the world as it's coming and and. Uh, God, I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I think you're totally right. We all have to learn, try and live as simply as possible. Um, but um, I don't know. I have I have a friend who, and I'm not saying that this is equivalent to what you're saying, but I have a friend who came up. She she uses this term, the personal responsibility vortex, mm -hmm. uh, and she she says that you know she thinks that. Um, you know, one of the things that capitalism does is turns us into individual consumers. And then we, we get really focused on what our personal consumption choices are. And when we're focused on those choices, instead of dismantling the system that uh, creates those problems, um, then they've rendered us ineffective. Um, and and I, I see Ben sitting next to you. I know that the two of you have long been involved in, in fights to dismantle the system. And um, that to me is, is more important, you know, than, than what our personal consumption patterns are. And, um, you know, people, the, another thing, you know, I, I don't blame people personally for these things because most of us were born into a culture where these, these decisions were already made. You know, you and I didn't decide to make American cities dependent on cars. Um, and there's, 
there's another thing that people do, you know, like I'm on my laptop right now on, on Skype or on Zoom and um, people always say, well, you guys can't criticize lithium mines if you use uh, laptops or cell phones or you drive your car. And I'm like, let's talk about that for a second. How, so let's say I, I'm, I just be completely pure, personally pure about stopping this, this mine. So the way I would organize support is walk around Northern Nevada, knocking on doors. Um, you know, I'd have to probably be naked or wear clothes that, you know, are completely made from animal skins and other things. Um, by the time I, I, I finish, you know, getting myself personally pure, there'd already be 10 other lithium mines in Nevada. Um, and so if we have to use some of these tools to dismantle um, that system that makes us dependent on these tools, um, to me, I, I don't think that the, that's an inconsistency. Or um, if it is, it's, I, I don't think we need to blame ourselves personally for, for those things. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I just wanted to share that because I don't, I don't think you should have to feel, we all try to do the best we can with our consumption habits. Um, but at the end of the day, that's, that's not the most important work. <clears throat> so, I, think that, I think that you're right. And I think that, you know, that's where the 80-20 kind of makes me feel a little bit more secure. And uh, I'm, Gregory Bateson is one of my heroes in, in, uh, in my studies. And he says, material possessions are the root of all psychosis. The, the more I think, you know, through the years, the more I've thought about it, the more sense that makes. Material possession is the root of all psychosis. Mm -hmm. You're a pretty psychotic if, country. If I could t just tag on one statement, just it, it comes to my mind all the time when, when I hear, well, you, you're not going to convince people to give up their cars. That's just not going to happen. And we, think about the inconvenience of it. And it's really going to be damned inconvenient. But you know what? Being extinct is even more inconvenient. <laughs> uh, you know, so pick your, which one do you want? That's what it comes down to. And I think yes. we have to talk like that, you know? Yes. I think we have to say it. Um, so I, I totally agree, Ben. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. That's very graphic. Yeah. It's also honest. <laughs> Yes, very honest, but painting a picture in people's minds is, is so valuable. Uh, any final thoughts before we say adieu to Will and let him get back to his lawyerly work? All right, we've got a donation link there. I'm sure you will wake up tomorrow morning and you, you will find you are uh, enriched. From, having, <laughs> from and we do, you have certainly enriched all of our lives and our thinking and our hearts that's i think your real talent will you really can touch people's hearts so thank you thank you and thank you everybody for being here thank you it was you. really great to have you in a small room so we could just hug you and have you all to ourselves <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thanks, everybody.